Send more caskets. Still at it. They want rap beats, gonna be a lot of dead rappers. Still at it. Some of my friends that aren't in the music industry or whatever, Skilligan's Island was their first time really getting exposed to you. And then uh, a lot of people like to watch these, of course, with Eminem. So uh, what did you notice about how you were perceived or looked at when people knew you did a song with Eminem on that project? I mean, um, me and Eminem was still basically on the same level at that time. So we was kind of both unknown. You know what I mean? We was both creating a buzz. So the song actually, I benefited more for from the watch these songs later down on the line when Eminem became extremely famous. Then it was like, oh, you got a song with Eminem. And, you know, this song was done way before he was famous. But it helped me more later down the line once he made, a you know, the big impact in hip hop. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as you're going through and you get land speed, you get traffic, you get this other distribution, what did you learn on the business side of things, having this larger machine behind you? Uh, how did you see how things operated similarly or differently than your own experience on your own? It was, it was basically the same, the same operation because this, this, it, was, it was the same route I was already going with all my previous releases, because I was still using the land speeds and the traffic as distribution when I manufactured my own stuff. You know what I mean? So it was just a way for them to maybe uh, do more numbers than I could do on my own. But it was always the same outlet, the same market and things like that. But, you know, what I learned was how to just stay consistent, man. That was always the key. Staying consistent. As long as you back that out, that project up with another one and in a short amount of time, you're going to keep uh, keeping your fans intrigued, keep them coming back, you know, show them there's no limit to what you're doing and how many times you're going to come. And that's when you really develop those loyal fans forever. You know, the ones that defend you and and tell the world that you're the greatest shit in the world. You know what I mean? Right. OK. And then how. How and why didn't, did you, around this time, start doing the uh, collaborative albums, I guess, really after Skilletary, but what made you start being open to doing that in an official way? Which ones you referring to? Well, like the Hurricane G, for instance. Oh, man, I'm, I'm a fan first, man. So if you see a collaborative album with anyone, it's because I'm a fan. And it's, I'm inspired to want to work with these people. You know, especially Hurricane G, when I first heard her her bilingual stuff, the first song I ever heard from her bilingual, it made me sit down and write my own song. That's how, and I'm talking about immediately after hearing the song, I had to sit down and go write something because that's how much I was inspired when I heard her song, The Underground Lockdown, that uh, Domingo produced. So, you know, I, I wanted to work with her, man, because I felt like, I never heard another Latin MC have the same kind of flavor like me. You know, like you could speak Spanish, but you you come from an all black background and neighborhood and all that, but you still have your Spanish language in, in you. And Hurricane was the equivalent of that for me, you know? So it's even now, man, we still work together constantly. You know, we always got new stuff. You know, she's always featured on every project and things like that. And, you know, it was more of a, a pleasure and an honor for me than thinking I'm doing a collaborative project, man. I was just being a fan, enjoying the moment. Right. So given that, why why do you think at this point that more rappers that rap in both Spanish and English haven't been more successful, more popular in the rap world, especially? Um, Because the way they divide the markets, man. Like they always, like anytime I was shopping my Spanish stuff, they was always pushing me to, to go to like the Telemundo and uh, Universal Latino and things like that. When I'm like, yo, listen, you know, my kind of Spanglish stuff that I do this, you got to play this on black urban radio because that's where all the Spanish kids are at. They're not watching Telemundo or listening to, you know, Universal Latino, and they over there on Hot 97 and, and all the major stations. That's where 
your Spanish kids are, you know, your bilingual kids are. They're on Black Urban Radio. I think they're always pushing it to the wrong market. That's why it hasn't had the, the extreme, you know, boom like it should have. I believe the, Span the Spanglish music that I do is the key to lock it down and to take it over, you know, through, throughout all these countries and things like that and really conquer a global market, man. Spanglish language is probably the biggest spoken language in America right now. Nobody speaks perfect English or Spanish anymore. It's just mixed up all the way. Yeah, it's definitely the melting pot is happening more and more and more. Yeah. So, so given that, and given that you have so much coming up, before we get to what you're doing now, what, how have you been affected uh, by the pandemic? As somebody that plans and has all these things that you do, did it really help you map out everything for the next couple of years? Did it hurt you because you weren't doing shows? Like how, what was going on? Um, um, when they went in Rome, right? Same thing for me. This was probably the most plotting and planning I was ever able to do. And I was able to finalize a lot of projects that I was neglecting for a minute. You know, things I had to edit, things I had to compile. So the pandemic actually served me a good purpose over here, man. You know what I mean? I can honestly say that. It's, it's bad we couldn't go out and do the things we normally do. But I was really able to orchestrate and prep a thousand other things, man, you know, to help continue to guide my path on what I'm doing right now. So I got to even credit the pandemic a lot for slowing us down and putting us in the perspective to understand where we at and figure out where we really trying to go, man. That's what I got from the pandemic, man. It, it, I used it to my advantage, put it that way. All right. And what stuff do you have coming up that you wanted to speak on? Oh, man, there's a thousand things. Um, I got the Thought Skillustrated album. You know what I mean? That's in the bag. Just waiting to unleash that. Got a lot of features on that album. You know, hopefully I'll drop it this year. Um, I got the maxi single, Two Live Crew, uh, Brother Marquise, you know, Nastier Than Ever. We did, you know how I do a lot of nasty songs. It's one of my, one of my trademark sounds, but I did it with Marquise from the Two Live Crew. So we got that project. I uh, got a bunch of new mixtapes, man, that I'm fiending to throw out. You know, um, a new a new one with Master Fool called Donald Dumb and Walt Dizzy. You know, that's kind of crazy. I uh, got a new remix album with DJ Heron from Miami. He he remixed a lot of Thurston classics and you know put together a whole new album, just a remix with all new banging beats. Uh, you know, we're about to blast off this Whiskey Run show. My brother Low Box, you know, just like a whiskey tasting show with cigar segments, things like that. Uh, uh, you know, amongst the next books, next videos coming, you know, on top of all the other stuff that's happening. Our Basil for 2021, we're trying to go hard again. Hopefully, everything is opened up. And, um, yo, just keep killing them. Low Life series coming soon, you know, amongst whole bunch of other things happening so as someone that's a rapper dj producer executive all these different things that you do uh now that you because of the pandemic and you've been able to strategize and do all this stuff how have you found uh you're prioritizing things similarly or differently than you did the first 20 years of your career um because now i do it more from the business aspect you know, uh, in the first 20 years of my career, I was doing more from the creator's aspect. You know, I just cared about being creative and being acknowledged and recognized. When, you know, at this point, I'm acknowledged and recognized and I paid my dues. So I'm trying to make sure I'm getting paid accordingly for what I can do, my experiences, even my even my words, man, my speaking, my talking, everything comes, you know, where you're able to monetize, man, from everything you do. I've branded myself thoroughly throughout all these years. So I'm continuously doing that and plan to continue branding myself so I can I can sell my toenail clippers if, if I have to, you know what I mean? But that's how it is. 
when when you make yourself that popular and things like that and you stand for something. So that's just my realm and the route I've been going. Right. And two, throughout your career, I've always enjoyed your album covers or your project covers, depending on what it was at the time. Uh, how do you find you've gotten the inspiration and the ideas for a lot of those? Is it just random ways or you have a specific way you do it? Um. I was always inspired by album covers. That's why my album covers are the way they are. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of things that that will inspire me. It, for one, it's the topic or of the title of the album or something. You know, like I've always wanted to come to the next level with it, you know, to really show creativity because I always analyzed album covers. You know, the entire time hip hop was born, I'm one of them dudes who read the credits, looked who was on it, you know, criticized if, if the concept made sense and things like that. But that's how I've always been, man. I'm a fan first, so I do it from a pet fan's perspective, you know? How would you look at this as a fan? So I think when I create my stuff, that's the point of view I'm using, me as a fan, not that, you know, uh, I'm the creator and I got the greatest ideas in the world, like, you know, these egotistic motherfuckers. I look at it like, how would I like it? I'm the same way with my film. You know, I go through, I go through things with my, with my production teams and stuff where a lot of people are more focused on the quality of the film or, you know, how big the, the pixels are and things like that. Well, I'm more worried about the content. You know, I don't care if I shoot it with the cheapest camera in the world. The content is important to me because I'm, I'm looking at it from a consumer's perspective, not from a creator, you know, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think people, people forget that the art of it has to be good or engaging. They get, they get lost in that shine and the shine. Yeah. The shine is fine if it, if it works, but everything underneath the shine has got to work first. <laughs> That's real. Yeah. So with, with the skill side of things, why is that something that you've kept going for so long and, and that's been so significant to you throughout your career? I mean, for hip hop, for me, it's always been skills first, not popularity first, and things like that. It's always been about skill, everything. You know, I'm, I'm the greatest era of hip hop to me was the beginning, right? The genesis, because it wasn't watered down. It was uncut. It was like pure cocaine, man, where it's not touched. You know what I mean? So it doesn't get no purer than this. And, and that's how I always judge hip hop. Because back then it was all about skill and originality. And, um, you know, when I became an artist, I was always called the skillful one or something like that because I was always nice with writing letters, you know, when I was locked up and things like that. So I'm the guy. If you want to get a response back from a girl, you know, I'm the guy you come to, you pay me a couple of packs and I'm going to write you a letter and guarantee you a response. And, um, you know, so even with all the other artists that ever came out, I always were more drawn to the ones who were skilled, you know, with lyrically, with delivery, with even within their image or their beat sound skill was always of the utmost importance. And then, um, you know, seeing the way EPMD did it with their business titles, you know, they had Strictly Business, Out for Business, Going Out, but that was something that also inspired me. But I, 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 like I always say, you can't be a biter. So I think I took it and I evolved it in a sense where I paid homage, but I didn't do the same exact thing. I just flipped the skill title every time, you know, and I, I just kept it consistent, like I do with everything else. It just kept people and draw them more into my world rather than me catering to, you know, what they want to hear or what's going on. So every time you sing that skill title, you know, you was pulled into Thurston Howell's world, man. And I believe like as being a true artist, that's what it's about. It's not about catering. It's about bringing them into your world. And that's how you help the people escape all the bullshit of life, you know? Yeah. And two, I think, with with you with you got some like uh violent stuff you got sex stuff you got bragging stuff you got comedy stuff 
the thing a lot of people have like a lane that they're in whereas yeah to me your your lane is every i, so I create the, I, I believe in creating the lane like i i always say that you know i'm a i'm a fiend remember i'm a fan first and all that i've never seen an artist with my depth of versatility like you said, I'm 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 so unpredictable on everything I throw at you. You don't know from which you know what I'm coming with next. You won't be able to predict it, man. Like I, I believe that's what makes an artist great. You know, your versatility, you could turn into anything, you know, and I've proven that over the years, man. Where and I, I'm I'm still proving it with all the next stuff. There's so many things I've done that nobody has heard that is just another a whole nother realm of, of versatility, man. And that's what I pride myself on. You can't put me, you can't stick me in the box and say, yo, he's like this. I fit in every motherfucking box. You know what I mean? <laughs> and when you say that too, it always made me think of when you check a box, Puerto Rican. <laughs> so yeah. it's like you got your own thing over there, uh, which I always thought was very ingenious and, you know, a testament to your creativity. So that's that's a, a, a great thing, man. All right, well, Thurston, how the third man? I really appreciate you coming through the unique access. Anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, what happened to Dana Dane, man? I thought he was gonna be on here with me today. Oh no, nah, he just said to say what's up. All right, all right, that's my dude, man. And that's another thing. Um, you know, Thurston Howell is a character, right? Developed when I became an artist. I got my influence from Dana Dane. You know, I, I studied how he was this tremendous, tremendous character on the song. You know, the same way the rapping Duke was, the same way Humpty was, uh, the same way um, the Gucci man, MC Holiday was, you know, the same way Slick Rick was, Jimmy Spicer. Like, those are the people that influenced me to be a character on my songs. Like, when I first started rapping, I, I didn't want to rap. And like be my true self because I felt that was corny. There was no skill in that. I could have rapped about the streets and guns and all that all day long, but where was the skill in it, you know? So I wanted to be, go against the grain. You know, I wanted to rap using no slang. I wanted to speak proper in my rapping because of the way I seen these guys do it. And I always credit Dana Dane for that, man. And you know him becoming one of my truest friends and things throughout the years is something that, you know, it's only a dream come true for me. Living it, you know, as the fiend and the fan and all that. And then, you know, these people become your peers. So I salute my brother Dana Dane all day long, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a rapper, but I have a similar thing, man. Like Dana Dane is somebody I grew up listening to and admiring and now I'm friends with them. It's just, yeah. it's amazing. Great. I remember when I was a messenger working in a messenger service. It was 1987. And the Dane the Dane with Fame album just dropped. And I think I'm, I'm 17 years old, man. I'm fresh out of prison and I got a, a messenger job. And you know, why? When you, I'm a foot messenger. So when you're doing your runs and stuff, you got to have the Walkman. And I remember the only tape I had was the Dane the Dane with Fame. And I probably had that one tape for weeks before I was able to buy another tape. And I listened to it front and back and front, back and front through for deliveries for weeks, man. So Dana Dane, like I said, he definitely helped mold Thurston Howard the third style. You know what I mean? Well, there it is. Well, man, I appreciate you coming through and uh, looking forward to your next round of material, man. Thank you. All right. Love is love, man. Thank you for having me. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for 
just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.